if you're on Crenshaw and you go south, you're going to end up in Torrance. You're going to end up in Hartthorn. You're going to end up at the beach. If you go north, you end up in Hollywood, Grand Beverly Hills. You know, and if you're going to go west, you're, it's only going to get better. You're going to hit Palms first, Beverly Wood, then Beverly Hills. So as I was growing older and getting into my junior high school years, I was still selling dope. But now I'm meeting kids from Baldwin Hills. How far is Baldwin Hills from my house? 15 minutes in a car. So I got this rich black kid that lives in Baldwin Hills that really loves drugs. And I'm usually banging his sister. And I'm selling dope to her brother or to her or her parents. You know, I took my niece through a neighborhood today, which is Black Pea Stones on Nicolette. But the owner of Zyler and Zyler, one of the biggest clothing stores in Los Angeles back in the day, that owner lived there. If I, if I were to sit here, nobody could dispute this. If I was to say um, Alibaba for Black Peace Stone Bloods was my best friend, that was my best friend. I trained over at uh, Willie Williams Seven Points Martial Arts. Or I trained over at Steve Saunders, uh, BKF, Kempo Karate. Or the blood niggas trained over at Jim Kelly. The old yes. So there's a lot of black owned business. Yes. Right? Yeah. And, oh, in the 70s. If you, if, if you was that dude that your parents, and again, you never saw this on the east side. If your parents can afford for you to train at BKF, Black Karate Federation, at Kempo on Slauson. If your family could afford for you to train... My birth mother was such a dirt bag. She could afford it, but she had money. She needed her money for anything. So I really was that karate kid that were going to sweep up the dojo to get martial art training from Willie Williams. You know, I was there when Willie Williams kicked Jim Kelly's ass out of his own dojo. And, and he Jim said, Kelly, for those who don't know, is the black sportation. Oh, person. yes. And I was there when Willie, Seafood Willie Williams wore his ass out and made him sell his dojo two weeks later. And Willie Williams took it over on King Boulevard. Made him? Made him. Both. Willie, to this day, was one of the... We, see, back then, if you was a gangbanger and you wanted to make some extra money, you want to get a real check or a trophy that had nothing to do with the dope game, you went to a tournament. It was a tournament every weekend. And the tournaments were usually in Torrance because it was the white folks putting them on. So we'd go there and tear shit up and leave with 100 bucks. Alvin Prater, Big Sleep. Fudge, Slip Rock, Ebba. Had to be a fight. You was known as that James Barada. James Barada. People miss out on a name. I get chills. That James Barada was this half Japanese, half black kid with an afro out to this motherfucker with the tightest eyes, like he smoked the best dope in the world. Had a six pack at, in the eighth grade, and James Barada would fuck you up. James Brodie would come to school with nunchucks. These aren't legend tales. These aren't urban tales. He would show up with, he dated my birth sister. And if you didn't have no pistol, James Barada was going to fuck you up. Was he a gang member? Oh, yeah. What yeah. gang was he? He was from 60s. Um, he ended up, sadly, the dope and the whole deal. But he was one of them tournament kids. Butchie Legali, who was from, uh, Butchie was a half- Tongan, half black kid from, but she was a blood. But we all went to tournaments together. You know. You had a separate kind of black. Oh, yeah, because of the tournaments. Because of the tournaments. Well, it's like the story if I'm telling you, if I lived on 3rd and 52nd, I know I'm going to see Snap, which is Cornell, who's a VNG, and we got to just. Hey. And VNG was a very. And it's oh, yeah, a still. VNG is one of the most underrated. You know, at 51, I could say this. VNG is a pillar. You know, Van Ness Park went two ways. You either went to the 60s or you went to the VNGs. So you had Vaudry, Neckbone, uh, Shadow, Warlock. They all went VNG bloods. But guess what? They were also junior lifeguards. Well, you could show up at Van Ness Park at 9 in the morning and get a free lunch, or you could show up at Van Ness Park because you went and took the test to get a junior lifeguard and you made $130 a month, not a week, $130 a month, and the free breakfast, and the free lunch, and you were respected. But when you 
took them old tidy ass shorts off and you walked out into the hood or if niggas would try to test you, you were still Vodri from V&G. You were still Ray from Rolling 60, Slip Rock's brother. You know, so you had that respect. You was Big Butch from, uh, but she was real from VNG also. You know, I lived in a neighborhood, like would you say, your questions are beautiful because I lived in a neighborhood where it was like, when you're on the east side or we in the ghetto, you're just prone to go that way. When you're on the west side and your dad is driving to Hugh, my dearest friend, Big Ice, may rest in peace, his tattoo right here, his dad worked for the airlines. But both the brothers, there was three brothers. One didn't turn out a gangbanger. One turned out as hard and a pain as can be. And the other one was with the bullshit. But the mother had a nine to five. They owned their home up until, you know, both of them passed. And, but when you give idle time, you have idle mind. So the parents sold, so that generation of black people that were doing a little better on the west side, they're also, they're working all the time. Yes. So yes. the kids are at home, and this is at the period, the late 70s, when, you know, drugs are freely available, mm -hmm. the gangs are growing. So, idle time, like you said, if you wanted to go out and get into the trouble. And you got idle there, time, you mind. got an idle mind, and if you hearing, let me, let me tell you a story that folks don't even know about. There was a club called 321 in Santa Monica, California. It was called 321 because that was the address. Which at that time, Santa, for people who don't know, Santa Monica was a little rough. Oh, yeah. Well, the promenade, the promenade in Santa Monica, um, 321 was literally one, I think one. Well, the owner was this French dude who said, I'm going to open it to kids of all races. Now, if you got caught anywhere near Santa Monica, Torrance, Harthorn, by the Vikings, that's what we called them back then, the cops. The Linwood Vikings. The Linwood I Vikings. I have a story in my YouTube about mm -hmm. Well, they didn't just stop in Linwood. Oh, you, had to, you had to get to that club. Well, who's safer to pick you up on the west side of LA? Another black person? No, a white person. So if I had Jessica Abrams, whose family was the OP founders. Remember OP, the shorts? Yeah. Well, I was fucking her. Yes. Well, I'm fucking her because I was in martial art tournaments with her brother Craig. So I'm fucking the sister Jessica. Come pick me up. And you have Luana Rawls, Lou Rawls' daughter there. You got Barry Gordy's son. You know, uh, just the insurmountable of different wow. races. Oh, yeah. No, no. Um, um, I'm sorry, Smokey Robinson's son. Rockwell would be there too, but Smokey Robinson's son. And I'm this kid from the hood, and you got me, One Punch from Rolling Sixties. Uh, but I got the Gregg family, who's a known big black, ex very well off family. I'm at this club in Santa Monica, and it, for the next five to six hours, I'm just as famous as they are, and I'm 15. So you've already established a pretty, pretty strong street reputation. By if you. Cass showed up to that club, they knew, hey, I had dope. And the story from them white kids is, that's that Crip nigga. You know, and you knew other blacks that were from Venice, like Jason Sugars, Big Fish. The first fight when I got to uh, Clear Creek Juvenile Facility was Big Perry, who started you can't make this shit up. My first knockout at Clear Creek Juvenile Facility, which was owned by a Dallas Cowboy uh, quarterback back in the 70s, and he opened up a juvenile facility, and it was basically like a farm, like what you went to Tent City in Arizona. And my first fight, I slept Big Perry, who started Venice Shorelines. Like, but they weren't black to us, because they spoke like, what's up, dude? You know, I'm a poser, dude. I'm a mobster, dude. You know, oh, I'm, I'm yes, that's how the black spoke. And we were like, what the fuck kind of nigga is this? What they were active. With the bullshit. But, well, Venice Shorelines was Venice Shorelines. But the mobsters, the KODs, the posers were black, integrated, 
gangs oh. that wore uh, tapered slacks, so they were like Doc the Martens, uh, more like the 50 throwback. So they'd have the Dicky slacks on with the I, Doc Martens, with the it. Dago tees and the, the See, Mexican flannels. Posers, mobsters, KODs were the when first. When did they die out? 80s, 80s. Around the 90s. Oh, they ran. They ran. Big Pokey, who, uh, Big Pokey was one of the last ones. And they stayed as an inter, when you say integrated, integrated. Like Mexican black? Yep. It, 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 they literally started as an integrated. You